Okay, good afternoon, and we are at our final panel of the day, and I'm going to save the best for last here. <laughs> and um, uh, before we get started, I really did want to thank uh, Maura and the, the IM Law staff for putting this thing together. It, you guys did a, a fantastic <laughs> job. <laughs> and then also to all of the, uh, the presenters that um, shared their inspiration with us today. Thank you all so much as well. And um, I, I have actually a little personal thank you to actually, again, to the IMLS. Uh, I mean, John mentioned earlier that, um, you know, going to Washington, D.C. was like the best thing he ever happened to him professionally. And I can say the same thing back in 2013. Um, my library did win the National Medal, and I did get to go to D.C. Although, John, I'm kind of disappointed you aren't wearing the medal around your neck. Huh? <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> I mean, because I know in, in, in Rancho, Michelle made a replica for her cat to wear around. Uh, I think it was a replica, right? And I mean, we could do a whole program and just fun things you can do with a national medal, but I digress. Okay, so a anyway, um, our topic is going to be on um, evaluation and sustainability. And I thought I, I would start our part of just to try to frame it maybe with, with a little story that if you're a library director or if you're an administrator or manager and you're in an institution that chases money or, in other words, likes to write grants, well then, um, you know, this is maybe a little situation that you're going to find yourself in because this is what I used to do all the time, you know, whenever we're in like the, the visioning or, or the brainstorming session, um, you know, when we're trying to get a grant together, there would generally be about four questions I would ask, you know, the person with this great idea, okay, so, you know, tell me about your, your what you want to propose. Um, you know, so the first thing I'd ask him is, so what need is this thing addressing? Okay, sounds good. Next one. Uh, so tell me about the innovative partnerships. You know, we all heard about partnerships today. Tell me about these innovative partnerships you've, you've got for this project. All right, sounds good. Uh, next one is, you know, so you've got to tell me about measurable outcomes and outputs. Okay, sounds good. And then the last one, it would always be the S word. So how are you going to sustain this thing once the grant period's over? And if they say, I'm going to get another grant, wrong answer. <laughs> and um, so what we've got today is our panel. They've kind of figured out that, you know, they've unraveled that Gordian knot of how to sustain a project. And I know they're all going to be talking about things that started uh, initially with either an LSTA grant or something from the IMLS. And so, you know, really with that, I'm going to turn it over to the, our panel today. I'll introduce them. Uh, first, we have Dr. Marsha Martis. She is an as associate uh, professor at the School of Information, Florida State. Uh, next to her, we have uh, Julie Walker. She is the, uh, the state librarian from the Georgia Public Library Service. And then on the end, my former partner in crime, she is the, uh, the director of the, the Rancho Cucamonga Public Library, Michelle Pereira. But with that... I give it to you, Marsha. Take it away. So I thought we were doing slides today. I guess we're not all doing slides. I'm doing slides. So we're going to talk a little bit about the um, uh, journey from uh, Bench to Trench of Web to Mark, which is a spin-off of a 2009 Early Career Researcher grant. And um, I, hope, I hope you enjoy it. So let's see if I can get this to go. So Web to Mark was born of an idea. In the last 150 years, we've gone from the discovery of germs to organ transplant to being able to print ears on a 3D printer. We've gone from telegraph to telephone to more um, computing power than put a man on the moon that you can wear on your wrist. However, you'll notice that the classroom for most kids has not changed all that much in 150 years. And one of the big reasons why it hasn't changed is because content delivery hasn't really changed. And so that was really the core of the, the project that web to mark was part of. And so when we started our initial research around that project, we were out in the field and talking to teachers, and they said, well, we don't integrate digital content because we don't have the time to find it, and once we find it, uh, frankly, well, I'll translate, their personal information management practices are a little wanting. 
So uh, my suggestion was, why don't you work with your school librarian? And so I refer you back to Renee Franklin's comments just a moment ago. Um, and the school librarian said, well, I don't know what to do with this stuff either. I can build these hot lists, but then I have to keep them up to date. I don't have access to the school website, yada, yada, yada. And so I said, well, you know that destiny system that costs your district $10,000 a year? Have you thought about cataloging the ones that are currently used? And so that is the other C word, in case you were wondering. And they were not any longer learning to catalog, and the thought of cataloging something terrified them. So I thought, well, gosh, this is an interesting problem. So we built a little tool called web to mark which you can Google. And it's so right now, version 1.0 is on a public website, and it caught on really quickly. So we had tens of thousands of users overnight. And so web to mark is very simple. You paste a URL into a box that goes out to that site, scrapes the content off that site, maps it into a uh, mark record because many school libraries are still on mark. Then there are scaffolds to assign a common core state standard and a next generation science standard. And then it makes some educated guesses through the wonders of natural language processing on assigning keywords and other sorts of stuff. And then you download the MARC record, suck it into your online catalog, voila. And so um, I was really surprised that it caught on this quickly because I would know, uh, so through the wonders of graduate students, your servers aren't quite as stable as you'd like them to be. So I found out because somebody in France told me before my graduate student even found out that the server was down. So it was that kind of reach that we had really, really quickly. And then the project ended. And we thought, man, how are we going to sustain this thing? We've got people who really love it. And so then the Office of Commercialization came sniffing around. And um, so they talked me into um, participating in a Shark Tank, which is not... Um, not the most pleasant experience you've ever had, and if you've ever seen the TV show, it is kind of like that, only the people aren't as nicely dressed. And um, so I... So as you know from watching Shark Tank, there are really two options, ugly baby or squatty potty. And if you know what the squatty potty is, then you've watched Shark Tank. So one of their more successful adventures. So I apparently was on the ugly baby end of the spectrum, but somehow I got magically uh, back-channeled $15,000 to build the prototype of what we wanted to build to, to, to sustain web to mark which would be a little button on the Share It toolbar. So you could pin it on Pinterest, uh, you know, tweet it, or create a mark record for it right from there and download it. So we get this 15,000, we start to build the prototype, we run into time after time after time, just we're not getting anywhere. So we um, then find that, um, I'll go to this one because, whoa, this is not the edited version. What do you know? So this is the, the slide I wanted to show you. Uh, so what I recommend is if your project is something that creates a product and anybody in your vicinity has had an NSF grant, NSF will give you $50,000 to do that market research through a rather rigorous process called i -Corps. And i really strips things down to the essence of entrepreneurship. And I turned to my doctoral student through the, halfway through the first uh, i -Corps session and I said, this is librarian professional development. Do you realize what an absolutely beautiful uh, workshop that they're giving us here about product market fit, about lead with your market? You have to understand what people want. You don't try to shove your product on them. You have to understand what their problem really is and then try to determine whether what you have solves that problem or if what you have could be modified to solve that problem. And so 103 customer interviews later, we actually did find out that what we had solved the problem, but not for the end user, for the people who catalog content at repositories like at PBS, at repositories at NSDL, and other kinds of content providers too. This is a multi-billion dollar a year industry, and bad metadata is costing $958 million a year alone in the education industry. So then the sharks were interested. So I just finished Shark Tank number two. And um, it, so we're now in the squatty potty realm. Um, so we're getting, um, we, we got into great talks with a company that I can't name, but they used to own a copy machine company, and now they own a major educational publisher. So um, th that could go well. But to me, as I listened to everybody talking today, uh, Malcolm Gladwell was, was invoked all over the place today. And he was invoked when I was writing these slides as well, because really it does come down to the three things that everybody's talking about. 
connection, making those networks, uh, being expert and being able to assert your expertise, and also being, although salesman I'm sure is, is the word that Malcolm had to use, but I think more being the advocate, being out there, taking your services to where they need to go. And then I did a little proof during the Kansas City um, event. And so I think what I figured out is what we do is the bench, where things need to go in the university realm, is into the trench, which is the lower le level. So if you want to maintain your project and you're in the trench, either you need to maintain your practice end of things or your research end of things. And you can do that by scaling out, like Project Nable did, or you can do it by taking it in a completely different direction, by building on that thing that's really working, like we did in web to mark It wasn't the public website that's working so much as the idea of better metadata, and that's what we're building on. So we're exponentially sustaining our project, and that's in a different way. And so really, you know, it's mathematics, everybody. <laughs> um, so that's, that's sort of my reflection on that, and uh, if you want to know anything more about my feelings about bench to trench, because I have this whole rant on whose trench that we can go to, uh, but thanks very much. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Julie Walker from the Georgia Public Library Service. And I think GPLS has the somewhat deserved reputation of leaping in where angels fear to tread sometimes because I can still remember 12 years ago when we started talking about building an open source ILS and the looks I got, like, really? Um, but um, in the aftermath of that decision, we've talked a lot about taking risks and how librarians are usually fairly risk averse and metaphorically jumping off that cliff, but really we did put a tremendous amount of thought into the sustainability and scalability of the project and really focused on the long-term results. We really weren't just looking for something cool to do. Um, we had to, we of course defined our basic need and our basic need was staring us right in the face. We were absolutely desperate. We were patching together an off-the-shelf ILS that didn't work for a statewide consortium and every time they would do an upgrade all of our patches would fail and we would start all over again and we we got to the point where we really had no choice we do try to use a lot of the basic tenets of project management when we make decisions about this and we looked at the buy versus build um, idea when we were looking at this but there was nothing to buy we had really done a thorough environmental scan and truly there was not anything on the marketplace that was designed and built to support a consortium like the Georgia Pines Consortium um, was built. So we, we absolutely had to do something. And we decided that we had to, we had to build. We had a unique need. Um, it was going to be less expensive. To, well, it wasn't less expensive to build than to buy. We could not buy it. And it was, we were the only ones who were willing to take on that task to accomplish it. Um, we took a huge amount of time to build the support we needed to sustain this project even though we were, we were kind of going it alone, but our parent agency, which is the University System of Georgia, was very skeptical of open source software at that time. And we really had to call in every chip we had just to get them on board, but we also had to work very hard every step of the way to earn their trust and to be really transparent and have tremendously good communication so that they would see that we really could handle this major project. And our first goal was just a product that would work for Pines, work for our member libraries. And we were committed to sustaining it for Georgia, and we didn't think so much about planting it around the world at that time. So what we really needed to do first was secure the buy-in from our member libraries in Pines, our constituents. So we spent months and months and months doing focus groups to determine the features they wanted, to do, gather requirements. And we wanted mostly to make sure there was a shared ownership before we got to that critical go live date. And the open source model in that case really worked in our favor. We were really transparent. There was a huge amount of communication. The open source community is, is really known for their great communication on any number of channels. So that, that helped us. It may have hurt us. It may have been a tactical error in that the very first day we went live, every open source person in the known world logged in to look at our, our what, what was happening, what's going on in Pines today, and it all crashed. But, um, <laughs> but the support we received from that open source software community was just invaluable. And 
the proof now is that it's taken on a life of its own. We, we were able, once, once this worked for Pines and still worked for, works for Pines today, is a great thing for us. We're not, we're not looking for a different solution. We're just continuing to grow evergreen. But it's way beyond the borders of Georgia, and it's way beyond the borders of the United States now. Um, so that, that product has really been shown to grow and thrive, and, and we're, we're still very proud that it, was, that it was planted in Georgia for the first time. And we still work really hard to continue to build that Evergreen community. Uh, we send our entire Pine staff to the Evergreen meetings, and they serve on all the, the crucial committees um, for Evergreen. So we are absolutely committed to continuing to sustain that, that product throughout the world. And it's really gratifying to see all the different libraries that it works for. But once we caught our breath from Evergreen, a new challenge popped up, and the idea started to build that, hey, we could take the basis of the Evergreen software and build a product for the libraries for the blind and physically handicapped. Because we were hearing from a lot of state libraries that the one product that was available um, for them was somewhat unsatisfactory. And said, well, well, let's take a look at that. So thanks to a, a grant, an IMLS grant, um, we were able to pull together a convening in Atlanta uh, with people from the large majority of the state libraries to come and talk about that idea and to do a requirements gathering. And um, it was a great, robust, useful week-long conference. The correct participants were at the table. There was a lot of enthusiasm about the pro project. But it was really a case of poor timing because we had a great white paper that came out of the pro project. And then we started talking to the people who had come and who had been the most enthusiastic about participating about, okay, so who's in? Who's in for uh, funding and helping us and providing resources to build this? And that was right at the moment the economy went way, way, way south. And nobody had the bandwidth, nobody had the capacity, nobody had the resources to do that project at that time. We couldn't undertake it alone, and nobody else was able to step up to partner with us. So we had to learn when to let it go. And I think that's a really valuable lesson when we're talking about grant-funded projects or any of these new innovative ideas. Sometimes the time is just not right. Sometimes you can't afford to let yourself get so attached to an idea that it's going to drain the resources away from the other things that you have to be doing. So Loblolly, which was the name of that project, may yet resurface, and it's a great example, I think, of um, knowing when to step back from an unsustainable idea. Quickly, quickly, I'll talk about the project that we're midway through right now. It's called our B4 Early Literacy Initiative, another IMLS-funded project. B4 stands for birth to four or the year's B4 kindergarten. Uh, focuses on family literacy and has a centerpiece of reading 1,000 books B4 kindergarten. So our libraries are really running with that this summer. The great thing about this project and the thing we're really excited about is that we looked at existing models. We didn't try to develop a new thing just to say GPLS had developed a new thing. We took two nationally recognized early literacy programs, Every Child Ready to Read and Primetime Preschool, very solid, very proven programs. We're piloting each of those in six different library systems. And we're really focusing on evaluation. We know that we are not experts on evaluating early literacy programs. Most librarians aren't. We don't, we don't have that background and training. So we have an expert from the University of Georgia. She's been involved every step of the way. She's going to evaluate the participants in those programs, and we're going to come out at the end with, with some idea of which one is the most effective for families in Georgia. And then that will allow us once we look at those results to see what we want to roll out statewide. So those are, th are three big things that we've been working on in Georgia that the, our wonderful federal partners have, have funded for us and some very different outcomes. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michelle Pereira, and I'm from the Rancho Cucamonga Library. And I want to talk to you about our Play and Learn Islands, which is probably my favorite project that I've worked on, or at least one of two favorite projects. And just in luck, I'm going to mention both of them. So our Play and Learn Island project started with a needs assessment. We were trying to figure out what to do with 14,000 square feet that we have on our second floor. And it was overwhelmingly a response from our public that they wanted some kind of interactive experience for their kids. They wanted their children to learn something through play. They wanted their kids to be able to come to the library and do something. 
and it was right when the economy tanked, so we just didn't have the money to complete that second floor, but we thought we can still do something with this data. So we decided to create our Play and Learn Islands, which are small scale interactive exhibits for children. We were fortunate to get several grants from the California State Library to help us fund it, as well as some money from our library foundation. So we contracted with a museum designer because those are the experts on creating exhibits. I just got a couple of pictures that are behind me to show you. And we created several Play and Learn Islands. One was about building, where kids were learning how to design and redesign. Another one was about digging, which really was very versatile. It could be just a sandbox with like a dino dig. For a Chinese New Year program, we put terracotta warriors in there, and they got to dig those out. So we found that it was just really something that you could use for any type of event. We also created a farmer's market, a little stand. It's a miniature farmer's market that really worked well with our Healthy Communities Initiative in Rancho Cucamonga and has been popular in other libraries because a lot of libraries are in cities are doing Healthy Communities Initiatives. And it really conveys the concept of from the field to the market to the table. And actually, there's the one right there with um, just some pictures of the vegetables. And there's some mulch in there they can actually dig and find what they're looking for. Um, so we piloted these in our libraries, and we found them to be pretty darn popular kids. We were worried about having to teach kids what to do with them and how to use them. Kids don't need to be taught anything. They just kind of roll up to something that looks fun, and they play. They learn about sharing and really those good socialization skills with other kids as well. So it worked in our library, and we thought, well, if it can work in our library, maybe it can work in other libraries. So we created, we went back to the state library and applied for some more money to build some more of these that we could loan for free to other California libraries. And they were super popular in the other libraries. Well, they worked for us, why not work for others? Because the great thing about them was it gave people something to do when you walked into that library. There was always an activity out there. It could be the exact same activity every single time that child walks in, because some kids like repetition, or it could be completely different every time you walked in. But the best part of it was it was unstructured, and they could make it whatever they wanted. So we started loaning them to libraries, and then we found libraries didn't want to give them back. <laughs> so you can get the repo truck to go out there. No. So we thought, wait a minute, why aren't we selling these to other libraries? So we created a plan to try and sell these to libraries. We've loaned them to about 35 libraries. We have since sold them to about 40. And it is just been a great experience. I mean, imagine being the nerdy librarian that I am. Wherever I am, I'm going to pop into the local library. And we were in Folsom for, for some reason, and I went into the library, and there's a Play and Learn Island there. And the staff person just started talking to me because I was, you know, wandering around looking like this creepy adult in the children's room <laughs> and said, oh, and let me show you about our Play and Learn Island. And I thought, I created that. How cool is that <laughs> that they're now telling me about it? Of course, I did go to another library once and saw a play in Learn Island and realized they totally ripped us off mm -hmm. and designed, copied our design. But as part of the process for creating these, we also trademarked them and really came up with a good plan in order to try and sell them to other libraries. So that having a little bit of money that we earn from these helps us to sustain this project. It allows us to create more for our library. It allows us to design a few more. But that's really not what's going to sustain the project. Money, as hard as it is to find, is not the hardest thing to find in the world. What's sustaining it are our staff. So we really spent a lot of time training our staff in early childhood development, in brain development, and that cognitive learning skills, because that is what's going to sustain it. They're excited about it. They feel confident about this. They want to create more. So by giving them that knowledge and not just saying, we're going to embark on a project and we're not going to give you any training or any resources, which is what we often do a little too often, that really got them excited and really bought into the project. And that's what's going to keep it going. So from there, we kind of I'm going to segue into another project, which is our Staff Innovation Fund, which is also about training and sustainability because we realized well if we train them on this area early learning and they're keeping this project alive very easily well what if we expanded that so we created this program which was a 10-part training program grants public speaking marketing and branding dealing with conflict putting together teams trend watching 
And by putting that, that training series together, our staff really was able to gain a lot of confidence and be able to sustain any project they wanted to do because they had the skills to do it. So now they're out there trying to find money. They're out there looking for experts. They're out there looking for resources. It's not beholden upon me or one person or two people in my organization to do that. So the Staff Innovation Fund, first part was 10 training sessions. The second part is an innovation fund where they can apply for money to try and create the projects they want. And some of them have gone on to create projects that deal with the play in Learn Islands. One created a new one, a, re a renewable energy play in Learn Island, which really has a working solar panel, teaches kids about wind energy, about water. And, it, and it's just a great thing to kind of create something. And because staff is trained and they feel confident, they sustain it and they go off and do it themselves. And our staff innovation fund it just is, you know, is, is something that's really been funded by the California State Library, and they have continued to fund it over the years, not just for our library, but they've continued to fund it for other libraries in California. And to date, about 25 libraries in California have gone through this program, done the 10-part training, and then also have been um, able to apply for money to do their passion projects that really benefit the community in their own libraries. Thank you. Okay, so uh, if there's anyone out in the live stream world or in the room that has questions, comments for the panel, and since I have a microphone, I've got one, because you all make these things sound so easy, but I suspect along the way you ran into a few road bumps, so would you mind sharing some of those things with us? I'd be happy to share one. Um, so I made it, I did make it sound great that those Play and Learn Islands came out as well as they did, but one of them which is the one we don't talk about, um, like totally sucked. Um, we, we got this, we thought we'd looked at the schematics really well and then it showed up. And instead of being this like really versatile play in Learn Island that could, you know, has got like German engineering, it can turn wheels really easily, move around the library, go outside. This thing weighed like 150 pounds and we couldn't move it. There were no wheels and it had this like, it was supposed to be about movement. So it had this, yeah, I know, <laughs> ironic. And it had this pulley that you crank. Well, the first crank we did, it died. And it, the top crank looked like a guillotine. So for something for kids, having something that looks like a guillotine that can chop off their heads, not so great. But the, and then we had this book wheel, and the idea was it for it to look like a little Ferris wheel of books going around. And we saw this thing, and it was taller than we were, and kids were trying to climb into it because they wanted to go around. But the best part about this was the ball run that we had on here, which, you know, you connect the pipes together and you drop the ball and it goes through. It was a choking hazard. So that was a big failure. But what we learned from that, well, one, learn what a choking hazard is early and often. But then really, you know, it's okay if something doesn't work out because all the rest were really successful. And as we move forward, we really learned about, okay, we need to have something that moves easily. We need to have something that's versatile. We need to have something that kids are going to enjoy but to still be very safe as well. So it was a good learning experience. Okay. Anyone else have anything you people might find interesting that maybe didn't work out the way you thought it was gonna? Well, we certainly did have to do a lot of talking to our libraries out in Georgia when we were working on our Evergreen project because I think they kind of gotten to the point of what are those people gonna come up with next and do we really trust that, that these four guys sitting in the office in Atlanta drinking Mellow Yellow and eating Snickers bars are gonna come up with an ILS that we can actually all trust and use with, it, with all of our, our data. And, as I said, a couple of the things. One was that everybody in the world looked in on the very first day, but also we had a lot of brand new staff the day we went live and we had worked because all the Pines libraries had to go live the same day. We couldn't pilot this. This was an all or nothing proposition. So our entire staff had been up for four straight days to, to bring, migrate all the patrons, all the items, all the transactions, everything to go live the day after Labor Day. Um, and so we were utterly exhausted that first day before it even started. So that, that was probably not the best idea in the world. 
but we we learned to keep our partners and our friends very close to us to not spring anything on them to not make any moves any sudden moves that they weren't prepared for so that they really felt confident i guess the only other thing that was a little bit dicey and still to this day there are some vendors that i feel like snarl at us a little bit as we walk by because you know once you have displaced a major vendor product you're never going to be their best friend anymore <laughs> so we have learned that we have any in the room or did anything come in over Twitter? Right. Michelle, are the training programs, are they online or are they face-to-face? -face or how do you deliver those segments? They're face-to-face. -face. And what we found by having a large number of our staff go through it together, or in these other libraries, a large number of staff go through it, you know, between, I mean, up to about 35, 40, is it works as such a good team building experience that everyone's going through this process together everyone hears the same message and the interaction between an adult person a children's person a teen person a tech person the library director an assistant director everyone's on the same level in that training was really invaluable and having the director and assistant director sit through everything really is something that shows and sets a good example for staff as well and they can bounce ideas off and we found that as a result of that you know, you're not going to go through a training and the next day just be more innovative. But by going through those trainings and being able to talk and bounce ideas off of each other, you do become more innovative. Mm -hmm. Hi, Christy Hill with OCLC. Uh, I love hearing these stories of uh, sustainable projects. I wonder if you could, uh, any of you, talk about um, how your evaluation approach either hindered or helped your ability to become sustainable uh, once the initial startup funding was was spent well I would say in our case the our evaluation approach really helped us kind of keep the faith that we um, we were on to something and just what form that something needed to take uh, was something that we had to kind of work through. Um, because sometimes I think when there's money on the table and you're asking people for money and they need to invest in you, particularly from the private sector, um, they're very, very, very skeptical. And they, you know, first question that they want to know is, so how are you going to make me money? And um, so there were times where we did have various existential crises. Um, and in fact, I'm still going through one now between going the open source route and going a commercial route. I mean, that's something that I wrestle with every day. But the, a good evaluation and good ongoing dialogue with your evaluator um, is a way that you can just really keep, a, keep the faith in your idea. I think from my perspective, that was important. And for us, with the Plainland Island project, really looking back at how we created them, what we did, what we needed to tweak, what the response was from the public, um, certainly looking at the whole debacle with the movement one, that really helped us fine-tune the design and fine-tune what we wanted to do. And as a result of that fine-tuning, actually brought the price down about 35%. So we just seem to have more stuff than, you know, because when you first do something, it's like going to the grocery store when you're hungry. You just throw everything in the cart. That's what it was like because we were so excited. But then if you make that shopping list and really figure out what works, you kind of are able to um, make it as efficient and as um, cost effective as possible. And I think the evaluation effort that we're undertaking on our B4 project is going to be important because we need to show our libraries that this project really does yield results. Or maybe we'll show that it doesn't and, and it's not something that we'll pursue. But if we're asking them to do something new and different, I mean, they are stretched to the limit. They don't have any extra staff resources. They don't have any extra money. They're overworked. And while they're very game to always try new things, I think at this point we really need to prove to them that something is going to be effective before we ask every library in the state to participate in it. So I think that's going to be the important thing about the evaluation piece of this project is what, what do we get at the end and then what can we tell our libraries that will make them believers. If I could just tag one thing on to the end there because I'm East Coast time and I'm starting to wind down. Um, something that um, I do think was part of the evaluation. So there's the Web to Mark IMLS grant and the evaluation that that 
role play the role that evaluation played in helping us kind of keep the faith but then in the i core um, when we had to do 103 customer discovery encounters in four weeks and we were talking to everybody their mothers brothers cousins everything we talked to people from Flickr, google um, enterprise companies everybody to be able to actually listen to what people are telling you. And one of the things with i is you cannot tell them what your technology is. You just have to ask them, so in this sort of situation, like with information, where do you find your information? How do you organize it? What, what's difficult for you? What's easy for you? If you had to solve your problem, how would you solve that problem? And just kind of being quiet and listening and not being tempted to say oh we have the tool for you and and really listening that that's important too and you know as a professor i don't have access to large groups of people on a day-to-day basis you would think so because but in an online teaching environment that's not necessarily the case and uh it was just really important so that's a luxury all of you have the fact that you can walk out and come face to face with the people who make best use of your services i think is probably the best source of ongoing evaluation you can have and because you you really miss it when it's not there Okay, well, I don't see any more questions, so it looks like our time is up, but I really would like to thank the panel. Again, thank all of you, and um, Maura and Robin, take us home. Okay. <laughs>